Yeah. Hello, everybody. Let's go further on the second session here on stage four. Um, I'm really uh, looking forward to the next hour. It's all about uh, open cities and uh, EU project. Here we have two speakers here from the um, project. The first is Esteve Amiral from, uh, from Barcelona, the Estade Business School. And he will first give us a, a, an input in general about the meaning of open innovation environments for the public uh, sector. And afterwards, we will focus more on a special is issue. It's um, Carles Ferrero, and uh, he is just in general an open innovation expert uh, running a company in the sector, and he will focus on the challenge of large tourism flows of growing uh, cities, global cities um, in Europe. So I'm really looking forward, and the words up to Esteve Amiral. No, I have this thing. So thank you, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. <coughs> oh, let's see, it, it works. I would like to take this opportunity uh, to think about a, bit about a little bit about open innovation. We are working a lot in open innovation ecosystems and in open innovation in the public sector. And, well, this year is 2013, and in 2003 was the time when Henry Chesperu wrote this book, so the whole thing started. So uh, let me introduce a little bit the, the presentation, seeing what has changed in these 10 years. What is the different understanding that we have of open innovation since 2003 and 2013? Well, this was open innovation 2003. This is what we start in our classes, teaching about what the thing is. And then in open innovation 2003 was, well, instead of using only the ideas that you have inside the company, you use the ideas that are outside the firm, introduce them in the company. And they use that either to target the current market, to find a new market, or another thin market. And you take the ideas that are inside the company that don't have a business model, that don't fit this company, and you put them inside. And you try to capture value from these ideas. And, and this was Open Innovation 2003, very much what the example that we, we, we talk about. After that, several things happened. Well, these three books, another one, and these were in 2003, and still now, many of the principles of open innovation. This idea that if we have to compete with innovation, probably the innovation that we have or we can produce inside the company is not enough, that we have to do something more, something else. And this innovation has to come from the outside. This is the typical example. Every time I, I begin talking about open innovation and we need the typical example, then that's the typical example, Procter & Gamble, and how to make one more product for like the spin brush or any other things. And finally, in Open Innovation 2003, we, we think about all these new things. We think that it's not only about sourcing innovation, but also it's also be about reducing cost, uh, reducing risk, it's about having innovations that are mature enough to be put in, pushed into the market. It's also about reducing the time to market, and so on. But, well, it's not 2003 anymore. So, 10 years pass. So, what happens in these 10 years? Uh, well, it probably is not a world of companies anymore. Probably is not all this discourse that we are having. And we have to change a little bit. And uh, let me talk about seven things that we have been working in all these years and we are working, and that we think that innovation is different and has evolved since 2003, the open innovation to 2013, that that's it we are. Well, the first thing is that open innovation 2003 was about companies was about company A listens a product to company B, and it was about the addict relationships, and how to license the product, how to, uh, how to acquire the product. All these things were the core of open innovation. 
But now we are not in this universe of companies, particularly in the public sector. We are in a universe where we have multiple relationships. We are in a universe of ecosystems. Another important thing is that in 2003, and still in companies, there is a big deal about owning the innovation. I mean, you buy it, you license it, you do whatever. But it's about owning the innovation. If you go nowadays about iTunes, iPhone, whatever, all these ecosystems are in the public sector, open data, and so on, do city halls care about owning the apps that open data produces? Does Apple care about owning the apps that are run into the, the iPhone universe? No, it's no longer about, you don't have to own the innovation. You compete with the innovation of the others without having to own it. In 2003, it was very much about buying, licensing. Uh, lots of effort were putting there. And in 2013, it's more about how we foster this innovation, how we enable, how to make these things happen. 2003 was very much about IP. And 2013, it's about what governance more, uh, and business models do we put in these ecosystems to make them more effective. In 2003, a big thing was open innovation intermediaries, things like Innocentive and so on. What, is, what was the main function of open innovation intermediaries at that point? The main function was to look for an innovation that was suitable for a company. Uh, open innovation intermediaries were there to solve the, theme, the problem of, well, we solved the problem of innovation for companies by opening the search space to everything in the world. And by, by doing that, there were so many solutions that we can put inside the company, but this, creates, this created another problem. Which solution was the most effective one? This was the thing of open innovation intermediaries. This is the core of Innocentive, all these open innovation intermediaries that existed. In 2017, probably this thing exists too, but we have other things like managing communities, like enabling process that you cannot enable from the firm, like managing uh, communities of developers, like uh, producing hackathons, like uh, doing all these kind of things. It's no longer about searching the innovation in China or in India or in whatever that we can put in, in our company and that's it. It's about maintaining process, like hack at home or whatever. 2003 was about incubators and was about selecting a few companies that were hugely promising, promising, and then working with them in order to make a big product. But this is no longer the time in the digital world for incubators. This is the time for accelerators, which is a little bit a different story. You don't select a few companies, you select a lot of companies, and you try to foster them in an ecosystem. And from these many companies that you select and you try to foster, many things happen, probably not as big, but many things happen. Finally, in 2003, it was about companies that were competing with their own products and services. And this is no longer the case. Uh, maybe in Europe, the, the biggest representation of that was Nokia. Was the realization from Nokia that as good as the devices were, they were not enough to compete in the market. They need to compete inside an ecosystem. And this competition inside the ecosystem is what probably defines better open innovation nowadays. Uh, let's talk a little bit how this has been translated to smart cities. And, uh, well, here we have some, some methods, some uh, mechanisms to do open innovation in smart cities. If you look at many of them, is what we have been talking about. We have been talking about open data, about uh, experimenting in, in urban labs, about crowdsourcing, about all these things that we are going to talk later on in, in, in smart city, in, in open cities. This is the things that we are fostering on. This is not this dyadic relationship that we found in 2003 of what innovation can we put in a company to make them compete better in the market. This is more about maintaining communities, enabling process, intermediating between uh, a city hall and citizens and a diversity of citizens for doing things. Intermediate organizations 
like these ones that we have here, like Back Society or Code for America or Code for Europe that we're trying to mount, are again no longer like the typical open innovation intermediary that just finds a solution, whatever, in the world that fits your need. It's not about that. It's about maintaining communities and enabling processes in a continuous way. Communities and processes that are probably so far away from the city halls that cannot be really enabled from the city halls, that you need something in the middle. And while well, we have projects like this one, and so on. There is a fundamental change in the public sector that we try to enable. Because the public sector was not exactly competing with innovation. <laughs> so, and this fundamental change is this between service providers and platform orchestrators, platform managers, managers of ecosystem, you name it, whatever you, you want to name it. <laughs> this is important because if you think of yourself as a service provider, the only, the only relevant question is how much money do I have? How much money do I have? And with, with, with this money, how many services can I provide with the money I have? And that's it. You have more money, you will be able to provide more services. You have less money, less services. This is very much the old world. In a world of ecosystems, in a world of platform orchestrators, uh, you don't own the innovation, you don't own the solutions, so you don't pay for them, you don't have to buy them. It's more about fostering and enable. So the question is no longer how much money do I have. This is not a relevant question. It's how can I enable a community to produce solutions for that? How can I put business models for people and developers for profit and no profit to make money and foster in this environment? It's a completely different question. <clears throat> Let me talk for a second about innovation policy. Uh, we have been talking about how fast uh, our mentality, our thinking about innovation has changed in the last 10 years. Uh, probably we don't have such a big change in innovation policy. But our needs in innovation policy have changed a lot. And uh, let me see a little bit what our, our needs in this kind of policy now. Probably we work in a world where we are looking for more targeted solutions, more targeted things. It's no longer about redistributing money that was the case of policy. It's about fostering uh, digital innovators or fostering hackers or producing apps for transportation. This is very targeted. This is not a broad policy. You don't have a big solution for that. You don't want to target all the industries. Probably you want to target pharma or bio or uh, digital industries or creative industries. The other thing is that you have more specific objectives. It's no longer these broad objectives of policy, let's foster grow and let's promote employment. It's more about we want a digital city, we want a city that is more diverse, or we want a country that can export in this and this and this sector. It's kind of a different story. A big thing is the insistence in behavioral mechanisms. Uh, we are seeing in many and many and many policies around Europe thing, insisting in things like free and not free. I mean, if you go to congestion policy, all the time is, well, we change this free with a small tax, and this small tax makes the difference and takes some cars away. It, it's not about the tax. The tax normally is very small. It's about putting something that is not free. So it's uh, the use of something that is not free is something like opt-in, opt-out instead of, of having you to opt out, make the default opt-in. All these behavioral policies are common now in, in innovation policy. Uh, another thing is uh, we apply this to nonlinear systems. The, the typical example of a nonlinear system is traffic congestion. I mean, if you are in, a, in an old town and you have the whole street full of cars, well, you don't need to take half of the cars away. If you manage to take 3 or 4% of the cars away, people can walk. The traffic is fluid. And uh, you don't need to, to, it's not proportional, it's not linear. Taking only a few of them, eh, the problem gets solved. So you need policies that encourage these nonlinearity in systems. In the digital world, it's the same thing. I mean, we want to build on network effects. We want to build in, in these multiplied effects like WhatsApp or like 
it's again nonlinear. It's not we push 10 so we will get 10. No, we want multiplier effects, nonlinear systems. We work in complex environments. Environments we have multiple solutions. It's not we don't have a single policy. We have many, many, many policies. And uh, now we have a lot of opportunities and a lot of possibilities around uh, around IT. Uh, we have the opportunity to manage communities, to crowdsource solutions, to validate and test solutions, to do experiments. All these affordabilities come because we have IT, and all these affordabilities can be used in policy too. It's not. And finally, <laughs> well, policy uh, has been traditionally poorly evaluated. I mean, the evaluation of, of what it works or what it doesn't work has not been that much. So in innovation policy, we think that we can do three things in this new environment. And the first thing is like, well, if we have to, to uh, uh, try to tap into a distributed environment where it's complex and we have many variations, probably it would be interesting to try to capture the knowledge of people that are far away and see if the policy that we are proposing can work into these different environments. So co-creating policy in these complex environments is more important than any other things. Experimentation. All these complicated policies that are on behavior and so on, we just don't know what works and what doesn't work. And the only way to do it is put an experiment, try what works and what doesn't, and choose the thing that works. Uh, experiments in policy have been done, particularly in the Third World, in Europe too, in traffic and so on. And the other thing is how abstract are the policies, how open are the policies. Many times we have policies that are very directed, very focused. And this works if the people, if the companies don't have much freedom. But if the people have a lot of freedom and know very well the environment, we can afford to put more abstract policies, policies that have more mobility, probably where the agents can, be, can find their way, where the way is not the only one state in policy. Sorry. I have uh, no computer. Yeah. Uh, let me talk for a second about the, the projects that we're trying to put it, uh, the projects that we're trying to put here in, in, in in, in, with the European press and here with uh, Fraunhofer uh, focus on the, on the Senate of, of Berlin. And the first one is Open Cities. Open Cities tries to, it's in the last year, and tries to, do, to deal with all these things. Basically, to explore open innovation in the public sector and trying to experiment with doing some kind of projects that can allow us to experiment in these things. These are the partners. These are the different things that we're doing, from crowdsourcing to open data, both dynamic and static, urban labs that is using the, the territory in the cities for experimentation, for innovation, and fiber to the home. And this is some of the timeline that we we're having. Uh, Commons for Europe is another, another project. This was a video, but I don't think we have so much time. Commons for Europe is the other project that we are doing. It has two phases. On one phase, it is try to work with uh, hackers, developers, and so on to produce apps for cities. And on the other phase, it's about the telecommunications industry. Um, this is one thing that we are very excited about Commons for Youth. It's code sharing. Uh, code sharing is uh, an important thing for us. Uh, we have so many cities that have exactly the same problem. There is no need to reinvent the wheel in each of these cities, producing the same code, the same app, the same software to solve exactly or very, 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 very similar problems. So promoting reuse is not only about saving money, saving taxpayers' money by producing one, two, three, or four solutions instead of 10,000, but it's also about producing better solutions. Small cities or even big ones cannot produce good code. So sharing code is one of the things that we're doing with Civic Commons. These are the two initiatives right now, and this is the state. We have 11 fellows, 10 pilots in the code part, in the telco part. We have four fellows and four pilots. 
running in, 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 in Europe. Uh, this has been on for almost one year. Uh, next year, we hope we have more fellows, more pilots, more co-sharing, and many more things. Let me finish with a why. We have been talking about this first thing, about uh, cities and the public sector service providers can be only as good as money they have. And on the other side, if they manage platforms, they have an opportunity to capture and to tap into the, the richness of the whole city. There is more than that. It's not only about, well, we will be more effective by being a platform orchestrator and platform managers. There is a societal implication, a societal effect in this. If we are service providers, we end up about buying a solution somewhere. We end up about non-sharing, about local offers, about a fragmented world. If we are about managing ecosystems, we are about empowering our community. We are about <coughs> empowering entrepreneurship. We are about stimulating growth, because all these people are going to make solutions for the public sector, but also for the private sector. I'm going to make solutions for Berlin, but also for other cities. We, it's not just, the, we don't finish only in this thing. So this is the, probably the big thing and the big opportunity that we have in the public sector. The public sector is huge. It's big in Europe. Cities are probably nowadays the most active part of this power sector. And we need growth and we need to stimulate and reinvent entrepreneurship. Here we have a tremendous opportunity. Yes, try to use it and take advantage of it. Thank you so much. We have a, a short time for some short questions. Or sure. Um, I was wondering, because I, I'm interested in crowdsourcing, so I'm reading a lot about intermediaries. And as I understood you, you understand intermediaries as cultural translators between crowds and communities. And I'm wondering in general, do you have got a feeling we see more communities and how you define communities? Because I've got a feeling everyone, everything is now a community. Mm -hmm. So is it really a community or is it just still connecting just groups of people? I was wondering if you can elaborate mm -hmm. on that. Well, I think that you have intermediaries for everything. And some intermediaries uh, talk about uh, communities and try to establish things on, on, on certain communities. Uh, this is the case, for example, when you have, when you have intermediaries that organize uh, a developer community or a hacker community in a city. Many times is something in ad hoc projects. If you go to open IDEO, then, well, depending on the project, you... you you, do, uh, uh, you make um, a different you use a different group or, or you use this group. In the case of the public sector, in the case of smart cities, how to organize citizens, how to provide platforms for citizens to collaborate in the long run is probably more important. In the case of the private sector, that exists too. I mean, we cannot imagine nowadays many companies without this side of, of the cultures and things. I mean, if you go to I don't know, for example, SAP, Malab, Stata, all of them have a developer community. All of them do crowdsourcing uh, uh, in, in, in open source. Nobody can imagine any longer that you have a company like this and you don't do these things. It's part of the business. This community is stable. Well, in the, in the, private, in the public sector, it's more or less the same thing. We have to organize these, these type of things, I guess. More questions or comments or whatever. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, how about uh, what do you think about the idea of gift, econo gift economy comes into this kind of ecosystem in public sectors? <coughs> yeah, I think ecosystems in the public sectors differ a lot from ecosystems in the private sectors. Uh, the, the objective on, of ecosystems in the private sectors normally is, well, how we align uh, all of us to compete uh, together. And there is little room in many cases for non-profits, for hackers, for things for free, for volunteers, and so on. There is uh, little room. In the public sector, it's a mess 
to include all these communities, all these, all these parts. So we have to build things where coexist companies with uh, uh, volunteers, where coexist uh, big enterprises that want to resell products with uh, digital innovators that just was to help and test and, 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 and favor. So uh, I think we are, we are witnessing now this uh, mix of crowdsourcing. A good example maybe it's Android, where you have free and free and so on. We have a variety of, of many things. Uh, but this is the universe to come, for sure. Okay, no more questions. questions.